Hi, everyone. Welcome. We are letting the room fill out for a moment. So please hold tight uh, before we start. My name is Patricio and we're going to dream big tonight, today, I guess, for this animation uh, webinar. So hi, Nathan. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Good, good, good. We're just letting the room just uh, for a moment, just to fill. Uh, but first, let us know where you're coming from or how's your feeling. You can use an emoji here in the chat. And there you go. There's the first one. <laughs> awesome. I'm I'm just here in Vancouver, Canada. Or anyone else uh, on the on the west coast or otherwise? Yeah, tell us where everybody's coming from. Nice. East Coast, Toronto. Nice. Hi, Brent. Lucas, Vancouver. Good hey, to have you, coming. everyone. Look out from Barcelona, Spain. Tennessee, USA, represent. Uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. South Asia, like look at a lot of people from everywhere. Nathan, are you expecting yeah. that? You got fans <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> I wonder what time it is there for Nazim. Midnight. Midnight. Wow. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I promise I will not bore you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's get it started if you want, Nathan. Like, um, sure. Um, let's, let's just first sh uh, share some webinar guidelines here. Please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom uh, submit, to submit any questions. No chat, remember, uh, or the hand raising, please. So, and also this Zoom session will be recorded and, and, and a YouTube link will be shared for what you guys who attended to the webinar. Um, also like for the guys in Canada. So we got really good back, back to school promotion. So please check those out. We have uh, the link in the next slide. So you, if you want, we can also share it here in the, in the chat. So just let us know, uh, great promotions. And last, we're, we're gonna invite you guys to come and enjoy our new Welcome uh, Canada Instagram account. Please give us a like and, and that will be wonderful to have you. So you can keep uh, with all these great activities that we're sharing uh for canadians and uh, specifically and uh, and in, in this market right and last we're going to have our part two webinar with uh, uh with nathan animation in real time so this is for next wednesday uh september 15 at noon so without further ado nathan take it from here all right hello everybody welcome i'll just set up my screen share here All right, so hi, my name's Nate. I've been an animator for 15 years now. And today I'm talking about my favorite thing in the world to animate, which is like giant creatures and robots. And I don't know why I love animating this stuff. It's just like, I just love those types of movies growing up, you know? Uh, and I just love animating the weight in the big, giant, heavy creatures. I just feel like it's something very fulfilling when you can, get that uh, to feel convincing in terms of an animated performance. Uh, if you can get that weight to feel right, it just is a really fulfilling uh, experience. And um, it's often when you know you see a CG movie, people say, this looks too CG. And I think it's because my theory is that um, the weight is not right. The weight is just a little bit off. And so let's just dive into that uh, today. So. I call this dream big, you know, because not only for the giant creatures, but um, also for just kind of like my like my little bit of an origin story is that uh, I grew up in a really small town here in Canada. And um, to me, like ever working in the animation industry on these big movies, it always felt like a crazy dream. Like it always seemed like something that happened in the States 
hundreds of thousands of miles away with people who are, you know, like working in mysterious black boxes of uh, secrecy. And it just didn't really feel like it would ever, I would ever have a role to contribute into that whole world. Um, but I pursued it anyways. I was just still really interested in it. You couldn't, like anyone who knew me in high school probably disliked the fact that all I did was talk about movies and, <laughs> and animation and stuff. Cause I just, my mind was just so focused on, um, on getting there and doing this type of work. Um, what was your favorite movie, Nathan, when you were uh, young? At that time when I was young, I think- Like it, your favorite, your best, like favorite, favorite. My favorite, favorite. I mean, this is the one that people always uh, uh, hated as in terms of the trilogy, but I always liked the Return of the Jedi. I think I grew up watching that movie like 40 times on, on VHS uh, every summer. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> what was yours well good question i mean i really i think star wars will be one of those two um i i was very connected with those uh yes. uh yeah the trilogy of star wars it's just always nice to see the effects back then it was like a whole new thing right so yeah totally. yeah love love those movies and that's an imprint on a lot of people in my generation uh, and um, one of the last big films I got to work on before leaving the visual effects industry, I now work in the real time world, but um, was the last Star Wars movie. And that was, you know, even though it wasn't the most uh, acclaimed film ever, I had a blast working on it and uh, it felt cool to be a part of that kind of legacy. Um, nice. Yeah. So yeah, I've been animating for 15 years in a, in a variety of different uh, industries like uh, video games, movies, TV shows, my own short films, which we'll talk about more next week. Um, but yeah, films to me always resonated. I always have a huge, like I'm still a big movie nerd. I, I still, you know, would go to the theater if that was a responsible thing to do at this time. Um, but uh, yeah, just huge movie fan. And here's a couple posters of stuff that I got to work on. Uh, Bumblebee was probably my most favorite uh project just because um i just i don't know kind of really resonated with the characters and the storytelling and stuff and it was just a really good experience and, and nathan like sometimes your favorite means that like it was the most challenging project or it was more that you enjoy it the most <laughs> yeah i think i think i didn't really enjoy the production because it was so crazy like we were working crazy hours and uh you're you know that's part of the industry is sometimes you get crunched especially in the film industry um, but it was my favorite because I just got really challenging work that I feel like I did uh, a decent job at bringing it to life. And um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Nice. And look, I mean, looking back at it, it was a lot of fun. We were just like, I think everyone who worked on it went a little bit crazy for like that two month period where we're <laughs> working really hard, but uh, that's also part of the fun too. Like, for example, how many, like when you say work hard, is like you, that measure in hours or uh, is just the complexity on the animation or what, what is exactly you mean? Yeah, I think it's both. It was the complexity of the animation, but also the, the time frame. Like you don't have a lot of time to get it done. So got it. Yeah, it adds the, the stress kind of compounds a little bit. But the important thing is to know that you're surrounded by awesome team members who are all there with you and wanting to help you and make the movie is as good as possible so you know having that you know team behind you really does ease off some of the pressure which is awesome. <laughs> so how big is those groups that you're talking about teams like it's like more than five ten twenty people for animation of bumblebee i think it was probably 30 people or so just in our one studio and we shared the movie with um, many other studios around the world um so it's hard to say that's why when you watch the credits of these movies you see like pillars of names of people yeah. by. <laughs> you're the ones that stay at the end and watch your name like uh, at the end of the movie at the yeah, credits yeah, we always take a picture of our credits like yeah we're in there uh, <laughs> awesome uh, yeah, it's fun to celebrate those the, the hard work and uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so yeah, I'm an animator filmmaker. I love dad jokes. Um, so if you have any questions, I, I'm optimizing this for video. So I've lost my chat window. So uh, Patricia, if you don't mind, if there's any questions, please uh, interrupt me. Yeah, for sure, guys. Remember, you you have the chat here uh, and the Zoom bar. So please let us know any questions uh, as we move along in this presentation. 
feel free just to make any question. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Sweet. Thank you. Um, so where to start? You know, like I forget the phrase. I'm going to butcher it, but it's like, what's the best way to eat an elephant? You just gotta start. You know what I mean? Like, like you have a massive shot. Like, for example, this this fight scene here with Bumblebee being hit by the character's name is uh, Blitzwing. Um, there's a lot going on there, and sometimes it can be daunting to. Uh, when you see a shot like this, in hindsight, be like, where do you even start? Like, what is the beginning kind of stages of this uh, workflow? Uh, and it can be overwhelming. So, you know, don't, don't really stress about it at first. If you get assigned a shot or you're working on something that you feel like might be too complicated, I have a few ideas on ways that I approach shots like this and um, how you can approach your own work if you're into, you know, animation. So you did this particular scene that you're showing us, uh, yeah. Nathan? Yeah, I oh, animated wow. the shot, yeah. Um, and you'll see me uh, acting it out here. <laughs> so for <laughs> example, how did, what is your source of inspiration to create a, a, like a scene like this? Like it's just like a, someone, the concept uh, uh, artist tell you uh, how they want the scene, the director, how that works? Sort of, yeah. So the general idea is we get something called previs, which is like a very cartoony version, a simplified version of the storytelling moments. So imagine an animated thing that looks like this, but it's very simple in terms of the blocking of the animation and all that kind of stuff. So all I really knew is that uh, Blitzwing had to punch Bumblebee and Bumblebee had to go flying into the truck that's in the corner there. Uh, there's no real um, particular uh, details about how it happens. And the really tricky thing with a shot like this is that Bumblebee is like, you know, 14 feet tall. Yeah. But this thing is like 40 feet tall. So how do you have a guy who's like fighting someone who's up to his knees? Like that just looks really silly, right? It's like me trying to punch someone who's two feet yeah. tall. Uh, and that would look silly. So we had to make it, you know, look convincing and cool and menacing without without a feeling too, too silly. And that was my next question because that's like when you're creating animation or uh, in the movies, like you want to create uh, real scenes, right? The people can create that. Like you're saying right now, the height, the strength. How do you come with that idea? Like make it makes this this movie real, right? So that the people getting engaged. Yeah, you never, that's the number one task of any animator is to make people feel like this could happen. You know what I mean? Like uh -huh. it's believable. Uh, so yeah, let's let's just uh, dive in here. So the first thing you do when you approach a shot is you get what they call a plate. And so I've put in these elements here. These are the before and afters uh, from a movie I didn't work on. I just pulled it off the internet, but it's from Elysium. So they have a plate, which is just the, photography from the movie. And you can see there it's a helicopter landing in this like desert field. Um, but the artists then go in there and animate a spaceship landing, replacing the helicopter. So the purpose of this is, you know, you can see the camera move, it follows a real helicopter. So you get the timing and everything that's, that's in place. Uh, but a lot of times with these giant robots fighting, you don't get anything. It's just the camera moving around, you know, whizzing an empty scene. Um, so what, what I like to do is analyze the camera movement and let that inform my decisions before I start animating. So if I know the camera is going to whiz past this way, well, that tells me that I have to have the punch in the face happen a few frames before that, before the camera starts moving. Because it's a real camera and it's a real background, you cannot really change that. So you have to kind of work with those constraints that the director has already filmed. Um, and also before I start animating any shot, I like to analyze what is the purpose of this shot? You know, every single shot in the movie, you might not think about it when you're watching it, but it, it has a storytelling beat. And it's like, I need this character to, I need Blitzwing to punch Bumblebee so that Bumblebee can end up in this truck and look like he's defeated. So like that's got a, a very simple storytelling um, kind of rhythm to it. And it's important to analyze that before you start animating because otherwise 
you're going to miss out the intention from the director and it's going to not you're going to be reanimating it so it's good to think about it before you hop in uh and also how many, how many, Sorry, how many times you have to recreate a scene from the director <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's a painful one there's like some some directors are very uh, easygoing and they're more collaborative and some have a very specific vision in mind but they don't always know exactly how to you know what that might be uh and sometimes it takes a while to evolve and find find the shot um i mean sometimes on batman versus superman i've had shots approved on the first go uh but other times like on i worked on game of thrones there was one version of a shot that like got up to version 100 and then they they were like you know what let's go back to version four <laughs> wow so, <laughs> that, it, it happens it happens and it's not really uh the best when that happens but you know it's just kind of roll up with those punches uh and uh making it all work in production interesting yeah um one thing that can really help your shot as you kind of progress and get started is uh getting a feel for the character and knowing how to like just study everything else that's been done on the movie or previous movies. If it's a sequel or something like Bumblebee was, um, just understand, you know, how this character emotes, how it would walk or talk or, you know, move. Um, all those types of little things will really help inform your acting decisions or uh, shot decisions um, before you start. All right, and thumbnail. So this is just some uh, old thumbnails I pulled out of the archives for Bumblebee that are not very good drawings. Uh, they don't have to be good drawings in order to uh, just tell the story of what you're trying to communicate. I was thinking, you know, how do I have this 40 foot character, you know, hit this little guy? Uh, and that can be tricky. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it was a back and forth kind of discussion, a lot of discussions, but, the questions that I ask myself when I'm um, thumbnailing is, you know, how can I make this the most dynamic version of the shot? Um, I know that, you know, Bumblebee has to get punched over here, but what is the coolest way that can happen? Um, and I spent a lot of time in my thumbnail stage just to kind of help um, establish those ideas. And I pulled this animated GIF here from uh, Akira, no Akira, Alita, uh, the movie that Weta did. I didn't work on this movie, but I do like this principle of, you know, dynamic drawings can really help influence your animation before you start animating. So pulling out the tablet, getting the Cintiq and start drawing out those poses can really help um, establish the character before you get into any animation work. Because, you know, even though we're working in 3D animation, uh, it's still a 2D image at the end of the day, and it's still facing a camera. So if you can treat it like a 2D drawing, just like you would draw on a tablet or anything else, then that's that's awesome. So how do you start your processes, and Nathan? Like this is sketching that you're doing. Like how do you start that process, and how do you at the end? I'm assuming like you're saying you end in a tablet, but how do you start that process? In a piece of paper and a paper, or yeah, it depends on on what I have access to at the studio I'm at. But you know, I always use a tablet because I have a tablet there. Anyways, it's like my main form of input um, for uh, for any type of work that I do. Um, so if you have a tablet, open up Photoshop or even MS Paint, whatever you've got access to, just start drawing and getting those sketches down. Well, um, and do you use in the studios like any whiteboarding collaboration, kind of like a app that you guys share or it's just basically you and then after you, you pass that somehow to your team or whoever needs to check yeah in visual effects studios we we use uh it's called shot grid now um and they have a bunch of like uh movie review tools like where you can scrub your movie file and draw over it and erase and everything and we often will all kind of it's not really collaboration but we often will sit in the same room and just kind of draw on stuff and it's different now with COVID, but um, you know we would definitely screen share, sketch on that RV program where we would draw things over and uh, uh, kind of review things that way. Nice. 
Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's part of the process when you were back to school, like going now and this is on the back to school, uh, just to remind customers, uh, um, our, our fans or, or your, your fans, I guess, is how's that process look like in the school, right? Is the same that you're sh sharing? Well, in school, I would use like now, because I'm not in the visual effects industry, and this is a tool that anyone can use is, is Sync Sketch, which is a collaborative drawing like, like platform over, it's the exact same thing, drawing over video. Uh, and um, we can all hop in there. It's free to use. We can all share and talk about ideas like hop into Sync Sketch, get on a call. We can draw together and collaborate for free and um, over top of footage that's already been made. Uh, and that's a great way to review and, and grow your skills. Yes. Yeah, so Sync Sketch, check it out. Um, so here's me acting, <laughs> trying to punch uh, an invisible toddler, I guess. I'm not too sure what's going on there. But it's very embarrassing to share reference of yourself, especially uh, fighting when you're not really a fighter. So <laughs> enjoy this. It's going to be on YouTube. I can't wait for the comments. Um, but reference is honestly everything. Uh, once you have your drawing sketched out, it, it kind of gives you the, the uh, idea of the poses you want to hit. The next thing you want to do is get your iPhone or get any type of camera out that can film yourself acting uh, the shot and just start recording because there's little things in there. Like you see, like, I don't know how well my frame rate is doing, but like there's a little stutter in my feet the way my torso twists, these are little details that you want to pick out and study um, while you are animating. So, you know, this is very interesting what you're sharing right now, I, I, I think, because uh, even when you're drawing, you have like a, images so as a reference, like body parts and things like that. And then like you're saying right now, just to animation, you have to have that video uh, uh, in your hands or to refer to, right? That's very, super interesting, yeah. I found, I think. Yeah, it's like the drawings will influence your acting, but your acting has all the actual physicality and, and the nuance that you're looking for in a realistic performance. So it's important to have both those. Um, and also, like some people like like to reference existing films, and I feel like that's uh, in my my personal taste. That's something that I would not do, just because um, you want your character to feel new, unique, and different. Uh, there has been times where I've, you know, seen a shot. I'm like, that looks familiar. <laughs> and you, don't want, you don't want that. Um, and also, yeah, compare your acting to your thumbnails. Make sure that you're still feeling dynamic and exciting. Those emotions that you had in your thumbnails are still there in your reference. Uh, okay, so I'm going to share a little video here that I made. Uh, uh, I like to make short films for fun, and uh, this one was kind of multi-purpose i just wanted to make a giant robot in a city and make you laugh so um, before you start sharing let's ask anyone of the chat how they feeling if they're they have yeah. any questions please let us know so it will be good to hear you or at least like i said use an emoji to see how you think is so far the presentation sure yeah i'll just stop sharing so i can see the questions yeah, see if, see if everyone's doing well. So, so far, there's no, but I mean, I, I guess you can just continue with the presentation, I guess. There's one, let me see, there's an AQ. All right. And uh, Victor Huertas is asking, maybe it's a question more related to the editing, but what will be the essential type of shorts for a BFX animation reel, especially for an entry position? Thank you. Okay. Um, what would be the essential type of shots for a VFX animation reel, specifically for entry level positions? You know, I think uh, I think it's really important just to show believable creatures if you're trying to get into VFX because it's always things that you know we can't actually film. So we can't film a bear attacking somebody. That's why Leonardo DiCaprio had a bear, a CG bear, attack him in that movie. Um, and if you can uh, find reference on YouTube of something that, you know, is a realistic cat, dog, giant elephant, whatever it is doing something that might seem uh, dynamic and interesting, if you can animate something like that, I feel like that's a great um, entry level effects animation reel, if that makes sense. So the biggest thing is just having convincing characters, convincing weight. 
But how do you animate robots? You have to say, I mean, there's not many reference, so there's many reference. And what is the reference that you use for robots? I guess that's also like part of the question, I guess. Yeah, robots, I think, uh, is for, I reference myself acting it out. Uh, oh. I'm not a robot or I can't really move, you know, like a robot would. Uh, it's great to have that general performance there. And then you can kind of, we talk about it a little bit later, but we can uh, elevate the reference and, and move past it in, in some ways and add those more mechanical feelings in there. Uh, but a robot is a great shot for entry level. Yeah, I, I just saw recently uh, some anime, uh, some robots, I think from Boston, kind of company in Boston. Yeah, yeah. And then they're, they're moving like humans now. They're like jump obstacles. And it's very interesting. I mean, uh, that's another probably type of robots that you're, you can just as a reference, I guess. That's a great point. Yeah, is you can look at actual machines and how they actually move, you know, like hydraulic arms and how things like move and settle and get that weight in there. Um, reference everything, you know, reference is everything in animation. So you can pull it from bizarre sources. Uh, another question here, when filming yourself as reference, how closely do you try and match your animation? Or do you deviate to bring more dynamics into it? Thank you, David. Great question. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We'll talk about that in a minute here. I get into that in the talk, but uh, I use the, my reference as a base. And then the problem is, is like I'm not a great martial artist, so I don't want to reference myself perfectly. I will reference it for the broad motions, timing, and that kind of stuff. And then it's like you gotta start doodling the poses and reference real martial artists on YouTube and stuff to see, you know, uh, how they, how fast they can punch and all that kind of stuff for more detailed dynamic type work. Hopefully that answers your question. All right, cool. Um, I will continue on with my share thing. All right, so this is a short film that I made, uh, I don't know, about a month ago. I'm so angry. All right, Pacific Rim, but cute. Um, my son and I, we started making these. My son is four. We started making these uh, short films about this, this thing called Big Dinosaur because he loves dinosaurs and he loves pretending he's a dinosaur. Um, and uh, I also wanted to make this big robot in a city, you know, and just jump around and have fun. Uh, and I just, you know, Thought this would be a fun little exercise uh, to sell giant weight and everything as well. But let's talk about this. How big is that robot? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I worked on uh, Godzilla, we would make him anywhere between 500 feet to 200 feet, whatever the shot needed. Uh, so yeah, there's some cheating going on there. He's probably, I don't know, 500 feet or so. Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now that I, I filmed my reference, I have a general idea of what I want my shot to be. Uh, I bring that reference into Maya or whatever software you choose to use, Blender or 3D Max or whatever. I think it's important to bring that reference into your actual scene so you can just kind of eyeball it and make sure that the reference is feeling good and the animation is kind of staying on model. This is not good animation at this point in the <laughs> in the exercise, but it is just kind of showing a work in progress uh, and how I work. Um, how to export reference? It depends on uh, your software, but like I just go into a video editing tool and I export them as image sequences, and then I can bring those image sequences into uh, into Maya. So how many software do you use to create a, like a piece like uh, like you're showing right now on the like right now on the screen? Like it's more than one. It's just Maya. I mean, yeah, it's I mean, the main bulk of the work is Maya. And then like the final rendered image, I used Unity to com compile everything in Unity. But for this image here, the rig, the asset, everything is pretty much built in, in Maya. I, I just this is an asset that I purchased. Uh, 
uh, off off a rigging website. So you know, um, I didn't make the asset, but uh, yeah, Maya is the bulk of the animation tools for sure. And you have any favorite tool when you're using Maya? I mean, like to create or just to work on it? Yeah, there's a plugin called Animbot, which I talk about a little bit in here. It's pretty much the only plugin that I use now. They they've taken over, and it's a really powerful, awesome tool. Um, yeah, it's 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 the best. Um, so here's something that I can't do because I'm an old man now, and I can't jump like I can't do like a parkour lunge over anything. So I go to YouTube for that stuff, uh, and. You can see here, there's some reference I'm using, you know, like some of the kick in the legs are there off the YouTube guy, but it's a little bit different. Um, and, you know, the speed is really different. Making sure this, this robot felt big and heavy was important. Um, but the biggest thing is you want to try and get the timing and poses first, and then you can play with the speed and scale because this guy is a giant robot. So animate him like he's small, normal human size first and then start noodling around with the timing, stretching things out in order to make them feel a little bit larger. Uh, and I put this reference here because this is an actual um, uh, like athlete. She's doing this amazing crunch thing on her, like it just doesn't look real. So even though this is filmed and it's real, uh, it looks unbelievable. And so I put that here because like you sometimes, no matter how accurate things are in video, if I was to animate like this woman doing this crunch, uh, I'd be fired because it doesn't look realistic. <laughs> you know what I mean? So <laughs> there are times <laughs> where you have to kind of discard reference because it's not going to visually look believable in 3D space, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, that's very outstanding work from the, the lady in the, in the video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was about to joke, like, you cannot do that at the gym, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it, I'm working on it. <laughs> um, and there's also times where you want to exaggerate, clarify, and repurpose your reference. So what I mean by that is, for example, the reference of me punching the thing, that looks awful. If that was applied one-to-one -one onto the giant Blitzwing character, it would look really silly because uh, I'm not that scary of a person and <laughs> I don't have the same force that he does. So that's when you start analyzing your reference and saying like, once you have the animation kind of roughly the same as a reference, start going in there and saying, what, what can I do to make this punch a bit bigger or like the timing on this a bit faster uh, and just start analyzing your poses from your original you know, thumbnails even and bring that back into it and uh, uh, make things look really dynamic. All right. And, you know, I also just want to remind folks out there, you know, if you ever get to work on a film, uh, any shot can wind up in the trailer. And it's a great feeling. This is a shot that I ended up doing really quickly. Uh, it was kind of like a new additional little thing they added in there. And, um, um, I didn't really think much of it. It's like, okay, it's a quick little interstitial shot between from X, Y to Z. And it, it ended up in the trailer and it's a moment that, you know, fans love and um, getting, getting your work featured into a trailer is a really great feeling. But I just want to, you know, let you all know that you, have to, you can treat any, every shot like a trailer shot because you never know what's going to be in the marketing. So it's not like sometimes artists complain like, oh, I didn't get, I'm not getting the greatest work or whatever. And I just feel like you never know where your shots can go. You have the power to turn a boring shot into an amazing shot. And I feel like if you are, you know, uh, if you're interested and you put the work behind it, sometimes a, a quick throwaway shot can really become part of the marketing, which is, which is a great feeling. Hey, Nathan, what do you prefer? Like a more like action kind of scenes that want like you're sharing right now or more like a different type, like a, a action in films? I don't know what makes you better as an animator to create like this type, the same kind of like action scene or it will be what is better, I guess. Yeah, you know, I, I love everything. Um, I haven't just just the way my career is kind of shaken out. I've always done a lot of action stuff. 
Uh, I've done a few little more emotional things on Bumblebee, you know, with, with him being sad and, and emotive. And I love that stuff. I wish I had more of it, uh, more opportunities to do that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, I, I like action just because, you know, like it says here, I like to ask myself, what's the most dynamic version of the shot? How can I turn this fly into a punch shot here? And how can I make it like, you know, super exciting and interesting. And, and that's the type of work that will end up as part of the, part of the marketing and, and part of the trailers and stuff. And, and um, yeah, it's a fun challenge. And what about lighting? Like, do you focus on that when you're creating, uh, like for example, that, that the scene you're sharing right now, what about lighting and the, like when you're creating that um, animation? Yeah, so when at a big company like ILM, when I was doing this, uh all the all the artistic disciplines are all different people different departments okay. but um when we present our animation to the director we kind of have to light it a little bit just enough to tell like get the mood and get the visuals kind of feeling like it's more you know in progress with uh the final image so and sometimes a lot you know the lighting and mood that we established as animators does trickle down to influence the lighters as they go and do the proper amazing version of it. Nice. Uh, so yeah, it's really fun to have those kind of shot designing elements um, in there, like the sparks and stuff in there. You know, we time out a lot of that kind of stuff as animators and then the effects artists go in there and make it look beautiful. Uh, okay. Oops. Okay. So weight is everything. Um, this is a shot of Doomsday jumping around from Batman versus Superman. And uh, looking at it now, I still kind of wish I had a few more days to work on this shot, but um, convincing weight. So having a character feel really heavy is super challenging. Um, but some principles that I, I like to uh, focus on is I want the viewers to really feel the impact. And this sounds kind of silly, but a lot of animators like make sound effects, like this guy's jumping, whoa. <sighs> like you kind of have to time it out with your sound effects like that as you're animating. And as goofy as that might sound, uh, it does inform, I feel like the timing and the anticipated reaction that the audience is, is kind of expecting. Um, so timing is really key. Here and, and playing with this, uh, how much hang time and how that how quick the settle is on stuff when it hits the ground, all those types of things really you could spend a lot of time and really study reference of of you know buildings falling over or when they when they destroy buildings for demolition uh, and or if uh, you know there's a, something heavy falling off a building or something you know rocks whatever it is. Just study how much things rotate and land and how much they move when they hit the ground. Uh, weight is everything. Um, as I said before, you know, a lot of times when people see a CG creature and they say, oh, this looks really too CG. I feel like it's two things. It's one, either the weight is too light on the character or the camera is sometimes doing things that a real camera can't do. So if you can restrain those two things, uh, it becomes much more believable. That sounds really cool because you don't want to to look like cartoony. You want to make them feel like like people are part of that experience, like if this is real, right? Yeah, and it just makes the film much more grounded in reality. It makes these characters that are giant scarier, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I love this shot. This is a shot I did on uh, Godzilla and. Uh, there's stuff I want to fix in this now because this is like almost 10 years old. Um, but I love the, how this director frames his shots. If you go back and watch this movie and even his other one, uh, Rogue One, the Star Wars film, uh, he often films large objects with a scale uh, in the frame. So like, you know, he's got a little bit of cars in the bottom and like people running through frame. It gives you context to how big these creatures or spaceships or whatever it, it is in your shot, it gives you context to how big they actually are. Um, so having a little bit of that scale in your frame really helps sell the, the timing and weight as well. Um, and I kind of emulated 
uh, those principles in my short film here of the robot um, versus the dinosaur, the dinosaur. So I had the camera on the ground panning up and I think the birds, those like seagulls flying really help sell the scale as well. Uh, and it's just fun, I think, to, to display that contrast. And so whatever you are in your work, um, even if you're animating something really tiny, have something really big just to have that contrast and scale um, in your frame. What do you find more difficult, like the tiny animation part, like when you're animating like small creatures or larger creatures for the amount of details? Uh, you know, the larger stuff always has more things because you can just get lost in the details, right? So it's, I don't know. I haven't done too much small stuff. Like I, I wanted to work on Ant-Man to get those tiny little ants and stuff running around, but didn't didn't pan out. So yeah, it's it's uh, it's always a challenge. Every shot, everything is difficult. There's nothing easy. <laughs> <You know what? laughs> um, so I was talking about before, like plugins that I use for my software. You know, Anambot is a huge tool to uh, track the arcs. I just messed up this arc here just to illustrate the point I'm trying to get across is um, track everything in your in your animation and not just like if you use this it's going to track the overall arc of the center point of the pivot of the object but uh i'm going to show you a minute another trick that i feel like um there's things that we should track as well um, so there's a nathan so quick question like when you're a, a beginner or a student uh there's any um easy i guess like um a process to do this tracking or it's all the same no matter if you're a professional uh, this is kind of like a, a very fun, a fun, fundamental kind of technique that you have to use for animation, no matter yeah. where stage you are. Yeah, I think no matter what program you're in, what what degree of um, animator you are, having arc tracking is fundamental. Like you need to have that in there. It'll really help you along your career. Uh, but you know what? You'd be surprised at how many professionals, you know, just go try and be fast and we, we overlook these fundamentals. So it's really uh -huh. important, yeah. Um, so yeah, you don't want to just track the, the overall arc, but you want to track the edge as well. And this is a great thing what I do with uh, the Cintiq is I grab my Cintiq and I start drawing over my animation and I'm tracking the edge of this dude's arm as it's moving over time, because it'll really highlight if things are moving quickly, like if they pop suddenly. Uh, or any other like weird inconsistencies of, of your, your timing and spacing. So always, always, always track the edge and not just of like the parts that are moving, but like every individual part that, you know, just take your time, go through the head, go through the shoulders, go through every single part of the character that you're animating and make sure that the edge is not um, having any quick speed ups or speed downs uh, rapidly. Um, yeah, so that's that's a great tool for for me at least. So uh, before your Cintiq, you used to use a, a Intos uh, tablet, right? Yeah. So how, well, how's that difference between a Cintiq and a Intos uh, tablet for animation, Nathan? Um, you know what? I mean, they still kind of serve the same functionality. Uh, I recommend both of them just because, uh, like. Ergonomics is the one big thing that's important, but also just uh, ease of use for like drawing this kind of stuff. Doing this in the, with a mouse is impossible. Um, but with the Cintiq, at least you're like, I just find it's a lot faster. Like I can just quickly sketch things faster um, and more accurately on top of things. Uh, it's not like if you have multiple displays, sometimes the tablet, the aspect ratios can get a little bit strange. Um, so the Cintiq is great for this kind of thing. Uh, you don't have to worry about that aspect ratio. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so complexity. So we have giant creatures. Uh, how can you, one thing you can do to make it more believable is add complexity. So I had all these like tentacles to animate. This The only reason why this shot is still not real is because all these tentacles nearly killed me. <laughs> and, and they have to like, they overlap this dude's um, shirt and his, and they're all interacting. And uh, it's a blend of dynamics and hand keyed animation. Uh, and so I think we're, look at your character, your creature, and wherever you can, wherever there is a large impact 
or room for like anything to like jiggle, like muscle to jiggle around, uh, that's going to be your friend. And uh, look for those details and look for that complexity. When you're animating giant things, you can never have too much. Well, that's not true. Uh, sometimes if you look at some Transformer movies, there's too many things moving on. But try and try and find uh, a healthy balance of uh, complexity. All right, so this shot is a shot I animated. Uh, it's right after, which one, which one is it? Uh, oops. Uh oh, now I've wrecked everything. Anyways, it's right after that one shot of uh, Bumblebee flying towards uh, this bad guy here. And uh, the, the camera is, is following along with these characters as they tumble down these stairs. Uh, so there's a couple of tips that, you know, as you're animating these large characters, they often will cover vast amounts of distance, like they're flying through space or they're flying through buildings. Um, and having this camera tumble with them visually is very hard to animate in because uh, it's, it makes you nauseous, <laughs> just to be honest. And also the characters are like rolling around and it's really hard to find and keep your work consistent. Um, so what I did is actually what the layout department did is took the same motion of the camera going down the stairs and just removed the rotation. Because otherwise, if I was working in this viewpoint, viewport for, I don't know, four or five weeks, I think I would have passed out <laughs> every day. Um, so find a camera, make a temporary camera that works for your scene, uh, regardless of what the actual action is. And even if it doesn't, you know, if it's not going to be the final camera for the shot, just do it temporarily. It'll help get your work to look believable. All right, so this is kind of gross. I'm sorry if uh, this image uh, gives you nightmares. It gave me nightmares animating on this movie. This is from A Quiet Place. Uh, and the reason why it's here is because I just want to remind folks to stay in the moment. So I really wanted this. This is like the character's demise. Uh, he's in a lot of pain. And I, I really wanted the audience to feel the pain of like those like little things popping off as little tiles on his head. Uh, I feel like as filmmakers and creators, what we're trying to bring to the audience is a certain feeling. And if you know that this is gonna hurt this character, uh, let's stay in that moment for as long as we can and make it painful and really relish those moments where we're supposed to feel pain or we're supposed to feel joy or whatever. Whatever the moment is in your shot, uh, try to stay in that moment and use timing and poses to kind of elevate that. Um, and this is a shot from the last Terminator movie where it's kind of this creepy dude. He's a robot coming back to life, all creepy after he was uh, blasted by the protagonist. Uh, and ask yourself, you know, what do I want to see as an audience person? Like, what is the version of this shot that I wish it could be? And sometimes you're, you don't have that flexibility. You're often just kind of told to do this, this, and this. But still within those constraints, ask yourself, um, what is something interesting that I can kind of expose about this character? And for this one, they really wanted it to feel unnatural and, and inhuman, this, this kind of the way he kind of gets off the ground uh, and, and amp up the horror. And so I just kind of felt like, Let's see, like, what do I want to see? I want to see him, like, his hands kind of flexing and coming back to life as he eerily kind of <laughs> picks himself up. Uh, a lot of really strange reference was used in this from, like, uh, contortionists and uh, all those types of uh, magicians and stuff. It was, I don't know, it was a fun project. <laughs> that um, looks painful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's longer in the actual movie. I just didn't... Uh, I just didn't well, want to. But it kind of looks unreal, just like the video they show the girl working out. It's like yeah. kind of the same, like oh, that's kind of like a kind of um, almost not believable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't think, like, the thing is, a person actually did do something like this uh, in the reference. So, I mean, it looks unbelievable on a CG character. And uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and that's not, um, they, they work this on Maya, you think, or what software? Sorry? What software do you think they used to animate this? Oh, I animated the shot and I animated it in, in Maya. So, um, oh, Maya. Yeah, yeah. 
and I mean, there's tons of uh, simulation work done on top of for the clothing and all that kind of stuff. So what they use for that, I have no idea, but yeah, I have it in, in my You know, and have fun, you know, like, like I said at the beginning of this thing, like Bumblebee was a really busy, crazy time in my life. But looking back at it, uh, I, I had a lot of fun because I was working with people who have your back who are on your team and um, who are passionate about the film as you are. And I think it's really important that we cherish those moments. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know, you come out with a lot of friends working on these things. So no matter how stressful, tedious, uh, sometimes filmmaking can be, uh, don't forget to have fun. So that's it for me. I have the worst bumper image here, uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to reach me out, reach out to me out on Twitter. Uh, my, my professional animation work is at nathanthomasanimation.com where you can see my animation reel. Uh, but if you're curious about my short films, like the dinosaur and stuff, that's found at littlemountainanimation.com. Well, that's all wonderful, Nate. I mean, thank you for sharing your handle. You can leave it on the screen if you want to. Um, we will start the Q&A sessions. If there's some questions, guys, please just uh, let us know here in the chat. And Nathan, I think as well, you can talk about what to expect for the next webinar, like part two. Yeah, sure. So for part two, it's gonna be a little more hands-on. I'm gonna walk us through, you know, this whole new world of real-time animation and animating my giant robot uh, into the unity and uh, making that feel dynamic, getting those elements of scale there, actual hands-on uh, type workflow from me and, and my process. Oh, animation in real time. So that's next, same time, next next, next week, week, September 15th. Yeah. So you can miss out. Yeah, I hope this has been fun for you guys. Uh, if there's any questions at all, or even, you know, if you have a good joke, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, guys, don't be shy. Take, take advantage of Nathan. is here for you guys to help you and guide you in animation. Mm -hmm. All right. And if, 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 oh, there's a few questions. <clears throat> Okay, yeah. Any tip on how to approach the polish stage in realistic animation? Any specific details to take into consideration? Hey, Victor. Yes, so my polish stage is tracking. Uh, so when I was drawing all the edges and stuff on there, that's my polish stage, is making sure there's no sudden stops and starts in your character. Uh, I see that all the time now, you know, when folks are just starting out. So really take your time. Do a, do a play blast of your image bring an interesting sketch and just start drawing over it and getting those edges tracked in there so that it'll really highlight any sudden movements that will start to feel a bit unbelievable uh, at times. I mean, there's always excuses and, and reasons for things. Uh, if that's how your character is, then, then that's how your character is. But yeah, absolutely track everything. That's the biggest thing for polish. Um, Anna says, how long does your animation process usually take, especially for your short films? Um, uh, I mean, I'm very forgiving on myself with my short films. Like I don't put the same amount of grueling effort into them because I, I assume for fun in my free time. So the animation is not as polished in my short films as it is on the VFX, like professional side. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I like to move a lot quicker that way too, because uh, otherwise the, the small details, that gets tedious and that's not fun all the time. So I always say, um, I mean, my, I also do it, you know, when my kids are in bed at night and I'm done work. So uh, my workflow is a bit sporadic. I would say like I can animate a shot and like, like a decent dinosaur shot. I can do it in two hours and uh, cause it's really simple. <clears throat> um, so yeah. Hopefully that, that helps, but uh, yeah, try, I try and go as fast as possible with those short films. Yeah, yeah we got we, another question by, by Nick, Nick, Nicholas. Nicholas. Mm -hmm. okay, hey, what, what software, software will be the best for a beginner? Um, <clears throat> I think it depends on what type of animation you're doing, if you're doing 2D or 3D, but if you're in 3D and you're just learning, I recommend downloading Blender. Um, it's, it's free and it's got a lot of amazing tools. Uh, if you're curious about rendering, check out Unity. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff is also free. Just, I, I say, don't worry so much about software. 
just find something that works with your budget and just start creating, you know, you'll find a way to make something cool. I've seen someone draw something amazing in, in Microsoft Paint. And uh, to me, it's like, don't let the software hold you back. <clears throat> Hopefully that answers your question, Nicholas. <laughs> But yeah. yeah, and last question by David to say, what is your favorite shot you have ever animated? Oh, favorite shot. That's got to be hard to answer. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think, the, I think the Bumblebee one where he's like punching them, he's really small. The one I used from the, an example. I think it's my, it's my favorite because they were- Transformers? Yeah, from Transformers, yeah. It's, it's because uh, they were unsure how it was going to look for this big guy to be punching a little guy. And so when I had my first pass, uh, uh, I just, my, my supervisors were like, yeah, and they're really excited about it. And that's a really great feeling. So even if it's not the best shot in the world, I feel like um, impressing my supervisors was a really good feeling. And that's why it's my favorite. <laughs> nice. There's one more question, I think by Nicholas. I don't know if you can read it or you want me to read it. Yeah, sure. I've got both actually. I want to learn animations for game making. What about 2D animations? Uh, great, well, if you have Blender and everything going, that's awesome. Um, 2D animations, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, yeah, I would say you can probably do a lot in Photoshop now where you can draw things and do like their, um, their like a sequential thing, but I'm not really a 2D guy. So <laughs> I'm sorry, Nicholas. Uh, Nazib says, yes. how do you, how do you revive yourself after lots of not good shots? I know the feeling where you feel like you're in a rut and you're not having the best of times. For me, reviving myself is every single time you get a new shot, you have a new chance to kind of prove yourself or do something unexpected. So even if you get a shot that's you know kind of boring, knock it out of the park, and make it the best version that shot can be. Uh, and that will give you the kind of um, energy and emotion that you kind of need uh, to get back into the, into the game. Um, I see a question here on the chat that says, as someone living in a country with not that much infrastructure for animation schools and such, what is the best way in your opinion to break into the industry? Uh, that's a tough question because how I broke into the industry is different now because I, I did it 15 years ago. Um, honestly, I feel like if you have a passion for it, absorb as much as you can through YouTube. There's tons of tutorials on YouTube. Come to webinars like this. Come to my webinar next weekend and um, just learn as much as you can from the free resources that are out there. There's tons of them. And just start posting things on Twitter, on YouTube, get into social circles where there's a community for this kind of stuff and just start creating and sharing your creations. A lot of people I know hold back. They don't share their stuff. And that's because they're, you know, maybe a little bit self-conscious or whatever. And I feel like, no, put it out there, even if it's not the best shot, because how else are you supposed to learn unless people see it and they can comment on it and give you feedback um send it to me put it on my twitter i would love to look at whatever you're making and uh yeah just get out there the world of animation is fun and uh let's make it fun let's share our our uh, creation with each other you know that nate that's so true like all the animators or artists that have worked in the past and with doing that webinar so uh, and other activities they all share the same like just like the same message that you're sharing right now it's kind of like Please share, put it out there. Even if it's going to be bad or good, it's going to help you mm -hmm. to improve. And uh, you're going to get better skills just by sharing. It. And also, like, people will notice your work. If it's really good, it, it has that unique kind of, like, part of your style, whatever you're sharing. People will notice it. Like, uh, in their studios, and like you're saying, tagging artists, tagging uh, companies like Wacom, they will help you to put your work in, in, a, in a good window, like, for, like, kind of, like, a, give you that spot, right? And in, 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 in the... In the I guess the digital world. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great point. All right, I got time for one more question, which is what percentage would you say networking is the actual art itself? Well, I mean, networking is important. You got to get out there, you got to meet people. Um, obviously, now with COVID, we don't really meet in person too often anymore, but uh, get on Twitter. You know, as long as you're creating and you're um, 
you're not just looking for obvious like like give me something it's just more of like a hey i'm creating something what do you think but you're putting stuff out there in the world uh that's that's the networking that i feel like is more authentic and will generate much more of a response um sometimes i get messages from people on linkedin saying i don't can i get a job blah blah, blah. and it's that's all good i want to hear from you but also you know it's better i think if you're out there putting stuff out there and and trying to you know uh just foster the community of, of artwork and be a part of that if that makes sense <laughs> yeah well thank you nathan we really really appreciate you for your time for your knowledge and your skills that you shared today in this webinar uh my name is patricio uh, please come join us next wednesday like i said september 15 at noon now where nathan is going to show real time animation so thank you nate i don't know if last words before we close this session no i'm good thank you so much guys uh stay in touch and um can't wait to see what you make well, wonderful. And thank you for the welcome team, Tom, everyone uh, has helped us to make this uh, uh, possible. So thank you guys and talk to you next week. <laughs> you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.